morning, everybody. Thank you all for coming. And thank the Society for having me. And also thank very much to Rachel for doing this whole slideshow. I don't know how to do that stuff at all. So um, she did a great job, I'm sure. Um, I have also been a member of, of DAR for 46 years. And um, my mother and my grandmother were both also members of DAR. So I'm going to tell you what DAR is and does, and then share some history of our 300-year-old meeting house with you. The Daughters of the American Revolution is a national volunteer service organization. It was established in 1890, and its symbol is a distaff. The distaff is the straight thing that goes through the, the wheel there, and it's part of a spinning wheel. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, it is part of a spinning wheel. That, on that spinning wheel is the distaff, and the distaff is the thing that holds the wool or the flax that's going to be sp uh, spun into yarn or, or um, thread. And the distaff is a symbol of women's work, and that's why the DAR chose that as a um, symbol. And actually, tonight I wore my mother's high school graduation ring because she graduated from Girls High in Boston in 1924, and the distaff is the symbol for them because they wanted to symbolize women working. Um, the Daughters of the American Revolution is a national volunteer service organization established in 1890. I think I said that already. Um, the DAI is dedicated to promoting uh, patriotism and preserving American history. Every member must prove their lineage to someone directly involved in the American Revolution. It doesn't have to be a soldier, just be somebody that was in some part of the American Revolution. National DAR has about 190,000 members across the country. Our little Attleboro chapter, which was started in 1901, has about 60. These are a few of the things we do. We give two scholarships every year to students at Attleboro High School, and we sponsor a good citizenship program um, to four or five different schools, Attleboro, Bishop Fian, North Attleboro, Seekonk, and, and um, King Philip. And this was one year's uh, Good Citizens, and the tall one is Matt Lancaster. He's from Attleboro, if anybody knows him. This was quite a few years ago that he got it for, for Attleboro, and um, he went on to MIT. He's a great kid. We also honor outstanding uh, history teacher every year, from those uh, same schools. And this one was Joseph Girth from Seekonk one year. And remember those portraits because I'm going to be talking about them a little bit later. We donate Christmas items to the veterans. We clean, we put flags on the veterans' graves on Memorial Day. And that's at the Kirk Cemetery where we do that every year. And then we have a float in the Memorial Day parade every year. And we also, um, clean cemeteries every year. Uh, and we, we usually do that at the Peck Cemetery, which is out behind CBS on North Main Street. The big thing that we do every year, though, to preserve history is we have an open house at our house at, on uh, Elizabeth Street. The house is 300 years old this year. There it is. And that's a map, and you can see where it says J. Peck right there in the middle. And the next one, there, there's the house right there. And that's when it was connected to another house. And so if anyone's interested in joining the DAR, uh, these are the things that we do. And we do have a person uh, available that can help you with your genealogy if you want to see if you are eligible. So we're always trying to pr preserve American history and promote patriotism in any way. Once upon a time, there was that little house, and it was built by Thomas Sweet down on County Street in 1723. And then he got married to Rebecca Peck and later, and then they started having their children. Um, when, it was, uh, when it was too small for all of uh, uh, the, their family, Rebecca's family, the wife, had another house that was in her family that was over on North Main Street that was no longer being used. They had, um, the family had grown up and moved out, and so the house was vacant. So they decided to move the house. Back in that day and age, for some reason, it was nothing for them to move a house. They used to put it on some logs, and then they'd have oxen or horses drag it to wherever they wanted to go. 
So they dragged it over to where CVS is now on North Main Street, and they attached it to a house that was there already that had been in her family. And so they continued to have children there, and they ended up with 11 kids. <laughs> um, eventually, their family started dwindling themselves, and eventually this house was empty again. So it sat empty for quite a while. And then Simmons Factory, everybody remember R.F. Simmons Jewelry? They came along and they decided they wanted to build a factory there on the river, right where this house was. So it was going to be demolished. So the DAR, which had been founded just a year or so before that, decided to buy it and move it again. So this house has been moved to three different foundations it's been on in its lifetime. Um, move it across the street and make it into our meeting house in 1903. So now we can go in. This is the one half of the L-shaped meeting room. The meeting room is L-shaped. They had to take down a wall to make it as big as it needed to be for a meeting room. And so part of it is along the back end of the house, and the other part is on the side of the house. And that's the other side of that one that you just saw. There's those two portraits again, and I will tell you about those right now. That is a picture of Hezekiah and Sabra Peck. And we don't know what the dates are on it exactly, because there were five Hezekiahs, and there was three Sabras. And so we got their names, but we don't know which ones they are because they would have one die and they'd name the next baby the same after that person that had died. It just makes it very confusing. Um, they were probably done by an itinerant artist. You can go to the next one. Uh, that's the other half of the L-shaped meeting room. And that's the fireplace that's there. There's four fireplaces in the whole house, three on the first floor and one on the second floor. And then the next one. And there's the portraits again. These were probably done by an itinerant artist that would have gone from town to town with his wagon. And sometimes he would have the portraits all done except for the face. It could be a woman in a dress, you know, all dressed up fancy, and, and then a, or a man in a suit and everything. And then he'd knock on somebody's door and say, do you want me to paint your face into this portrait? And it saved him a lot of time, and he got more business that way. And he could do the, the ones with just the outfits in his house in the wintertime when it was snowing or something. So um, they had these done, and uh, they were, um, if, he, if you wanted him to do your arms and legs and your whole body and have him start from scratch at your house, it was going to cost a lot more money. And that's where the expression, cost you an arm and a leg, came from, because you were going to have your own arms and your own legs. Um, one of the other things, uh, next one. This is a, a little table in the meeting room, but it's got a cute little thing on it. This is a, this is not that one, but it's another one. This is a handleless cup and a deep saucer. And that's the way they used to eat, uh, drink their coffee or their tea. It would be very, very hot. So they would pour the drink into the saucer to cool it. And then they would sip it from the saucer. Sounds crazy, but that's what this, you know. This is all folklore, by the way. Don't hold me to any of it. It comes from folklore. We can't prove it because nobody's here that's that old anymore. So um, then you'd have this drippy cup, though, because you poured it into your deep saucer. And what are you going to do with that? You don't want to put it down on the pretty tablecloth. So um, we had these things that were called cup plates. And you can see there's one right there. Yeah. <laughs> um, and these cup plates were something that everybody had so that you could put the drippy cup on it. And cup plates were something that, a while back, they were a big rage. All different groups were having them and having their seals on them or whatever. But these have the town seal on them. So right now, I'm going to say I'm stopping for a commercial, because down at the end of the table here, Rachel can, would be happy to sell you some uh, if, when we're done talking. Uh, these have the town seal of Attleboro on them. And it was a fundraiser for us quite a while back. Um, and the town seal included. It's not like the um, city seal that we have now. The town seal had a plow for our farming, and then it has a factory for our textile mills or jewelry factories, and it's got a locomotive because we're on the railroad, and a chain for, for the uh, jewelry. And it says town of Attleboro. We didn't become a city until 1914, and then they changed the city seal to the one with the lion and Wamsutta's initials. This is the keeping room, and this is what 
we would call a kitchen. This was the room where everything was done. They used to spin in here and they used to cook in here and they would weave in here and everything. And that one wall there is where we have some things. That thing in the middle is the original deed to the house from the 1700s. And this lady up here is Marion Pierce Carter, who was the founder of our Attleboro chapter. And then some of the other things are different awards that we've been given for different things. This is the fireplace that's in the keeping room. And that little cupboard above the mantel is called the Parsons Cupboard. And I'm not sure if it's called the Parsons Cupboard for if the Parson came, they could give him a drink because that was where they put the liquor. <laughs> but some people say it was called the Parsons Cupboard because that's where they hid the uh, liquor when the Parson came. So it would depend on your Parson, I guess. And then the bake oven is right behind that other lower door there. And we also have a reflective oven to it. Go to the next one. And that's the inside of the bake oven on that one. That one shows you the beehive construction with the bricks, and that would be where they would bake their bread and rolls and all that kind of thing, baked beans and stuff. And then this one is called a reflector oven, and you probably have something similar to a barbecue grill because it's got a spit that goes through, and you put the meat on the spit, and then if one of the little boys had been naughty or whatever, it would be his job to sit on the hearth and turn it. And it kept turning the meat until the meat was completely cooked. And when it was done, it was done to a turn. And that's where that expression came from, from a reflector oven like that. And then right over here, you can see one of these. It's a, uh, a broiler type of thing. They would put the meat on this, and they could put it right in the, uh, on the... Uh, floor of the fireplace and it would cook in the coals. It would make probably a horrible greasy mess all over everything, but whatever. And so anyway, this is called a gridiron. And you know how a football field is called a gridiron? Yeah. That's a nickname for a football field because see the 50 yard line yeah. right there? Doesn't it look like a, a football field? Now I think we're gonna, yeah, there's the stairs. That's two pictures. This kind of looks like it's a funny arrangement, but that picture is the side view of the stairs and you can see how high each step is and how skinny they are. And then this is the way you, it would look when you were gonna go up them. They're treacherous. We have a sign there saying at your own risk. Um, but then you get to the top and this is the parents' bedroom, the main bedroom in the house. And that's a trundle bed that is pulled out at nighttime. During the daytime, they can push it back in under the bed so it's out of the way and it's got ropes wo wo woven into it, just like the, the big bed does. And that's um, where the children could sleep at night, because if they didn't have room for them in the rest of the house, with 11 kids, it was hard. So um, the ropes are woven into the bed in such a manner that uh, after a while, it might start to sag. But you can take one of these, and you can see it laying right there on the bed. This is called a rope bed key or a rope bed wrench and you put it in the corner loop, and you can start cranking it up like this, and that will tighten it again and bring it up to, you know, you might have to do that once a month or something like that. But um, that's a rope bed key, and that's where the expression sleep tight came from, and don't let the big bugs bite was because of the fact that the mattresses were made out of uh, pillows filled with straw, and they did draw bed bugs. So sleep tight, don't let the bed bugs bite. This is a fireplace that's in the main bedroom. Uh, this is the only fireplace that's upstairs, like I said, and um, it's in the parents' bedroom. And uh, in the winter, they, uh, they would use it as a fireplace, but in the summertime, they wouldn't use it at all. And one day I went into the house during the summertime before we had that fireboard there, the thing that's in front of it's called a fireboard, and there was this white stuff all over everything. And I'm thinking, what is this? What happened? and a bird had flown down the chimney and tried to get out of the house and was in the house for quite a while for all the mess he made all over everything. And so we decided that in the summertime, you know, like they did, in the summertime they'd put a fireboard in front of it. And the fireboards were another thing that the ladies of the house were quite kind of, um, you know, really concentrating on. If they wanted to have those painted too, and sometimes the itinerant artists would do stenciling for them. That, I, I made that one because it's not an original, it's not antique, I made it. And so um, they stencil them sometimes or they would just paint beautiful flowers on them to make it look pretty for the whole summer or whatever. And that one symbolizes family because a weeping willow tree in stenciling is the symbol for family because it spreads out and it makes more children all over the place like that. 
And uh, then another symbol in stenciling is um, the pineapple. You've probably heard about the pineapple being a symbol of hospitality. And that was because when the sea captains used to go out to the Far East or wherever they went on their ships to trade and everything, they would be greeted on the beach. With <coughs> the natives would bring pineapples and grapes to them. And it was a sign of love, peace, and hospitality. And they would show them what they had to <coughs> trade and everything. Then the colonists would bring the pineapples back. And they'd put one out on their front steps. And that would be a sign to all of their neighbors that we're back. Come see what we got. And then when the neighbors would come over to see what they got, they would serve them pineapple rum punch. And so the whole thing got related to hospitality. And that's why the pineapple became the symbol of hospitality. And then another one is wheat. They, they would do a sheaf, sheaf of wheat. And that would mean that you were prosperous. Because if you had wheat in your stencils, that meant that your harvest was in for the winter and you had food for the whole family for the winter. And so that's what wheat symbolized. So all of those different symbols on stenciling. And, and the little artists that went around, like I said, for, to paint portraits, they might also be stencilers because sometimes you could go into an old house and if you went up to the attic, up in the attic, he might have stenciled some three different patterns on the wall in the attic. And then the housewife would go up and say, oh, I want that one in my kitchen, or I want that one in my keeping room, and you know, that kind of thing. And he would do it in the room that way. So um, stenciling was a big part. And the reason they liked stenciling was because the king taxed wallpaper, just like he taxed tea and all the other things that he taxed. He taxed wallpaper. So um, they didn't want to pay the king's taxes on the wallpaper. So if they got their wall stenciled, it looked like wallpaper. Then also in that room, on that mantle, was one of these. And this, I know nowadays they have things that are called neti pots, and this looks like a neti pot, but this isn't a neti pot. <laughs> this is an invalid feeder. And if you had a sick relative that was laying out in the bed, and he needed some kind of medicine or water or soup or whatever, you put it in here and you could just pour it down his throat while he was laying out flat in the bed. <coughs> and these are called invalid feeders. And I used to have a friend that collected them. And you wouldn't believe the amount of different ones that she had. They, they came in all colors and, and patterns and all kinds of things. But that's what that was. That's the rest of that room. The man of the house in his bedroom ha usually had a table down at the end where he would write in his journals at night. And so that's part of that same bedroom. And there's a cradle there with a rocker for the mother to rock the baby in. This is our museum room. It's another room that's on the second floor, but it would have been a bedroom. But we, we have so many things to display that we don't have a bed in there. We just have displays. So that's a cabinet with a whole bunch of things in it. And then the next one shows, um, oh, the floorboards up there are very, very wide. Those are my feet, and I take a size 10 shoe. So you can see how big the floorboards are. There was a, a law in the colonies from the king that they could not cut down the big trees to use for the wide boards. They had to leave all of the really, uh, some places say 16 inches and up, some places say 24 inches and up. So like I said, who knows? Um, but all of those trees that would produce that size board would have to be saved for the king, for his navy, for his uh, masts, for his ships. And they were not allowed to take them unless a hurricane or some act of nature knocked it down. Then they supposedly could take the tree. Um, but these colonists were pretty sneaky. Sometimes they would put skinny floorboards on the first floor just in case the king's soldiers came in to check and see if they had, you know, broken the law. And then on the second floor, the floorboards might be a little bit wider. And in the attic, they're even wider because the, the soldiers wouldn't bother going up that high to check. And it's like that in my house. The next thing is this little jar. It's a beautiful little blue and white pottery jar. And I was cleaning up there one day, and I opened the cover. And I looked in, and I saw all that black stuff in it. And I thought, oh, what's that? I've got to clean this. And then I read the note. It says, do not destroy the contents of this jar. It is the burnt mortgage. So you know how when people used to pay off their mortgages, they used to burn them, have a little ceremony, because they were so happy they didn't have to pay their mortgage anymore. So that was the burnt mortgage for the uh, DAR house. And does everybody know what that is? I heard somebody say it. Shuttle. Shuttle. <laughs> Gary. <laughs> Shuttle. Um, Attleboro wasn't known just for jewelry, you know, folks. Attleboro was known as a textile town, too. 
We, we had two complete textile mill villages, Hebronville and Dodgeville. They had their own library, their own grocery store, their own school, you know, everything. And people came from all over the world, not to just work in the jewelry factories, but also to work in the textile mills. And so the shuttle was the thing that would take the yarn back and forth on the loom as they wove it. And it went back and forth and back and forth like this. And Colonel Blackington didn't live that far from the DAR house, and he had a shuttle factory, and he had to produce the shuttles for the, for the um, factories. And um, Wolfenden's Dye Works, that was also supporting the textile industry. That was the largest dye works in the world, right here in Attleboro, the Wolfenden Dye Works, and it all had to do with the textiles that we had going on here. This is a more modern day shuttle, if anybody recognizes that kind. But um, today we have shuttle flights and shuttle buses, mm -hmm. because instead of taking the yarn back and forth across the loom, they take yeah. you back and forth. Yeah. Shuttle flights and shuttle buses, that's where they got their name. The next thing is this. This is kind of really different. You haven't probably seen one of these. They used to memorialize the people that had died by t taking some of their hair and they made it into jewelry. Oh, there's a lot of jewelry that's been made from hair. But this particular thing is a hair wreath. And it wasn't just from one person because there's blonde hair, brunette <coughs> hair, gray hair, and everything else in it. So it must have been a family's or something. And they made all these little, I mean, you can come up and look at it afterwards. It's all just such fine detailed work of human hair. It's crazy. But that was to memorialize a family or a person or whatever. So this is the back bedroom. And it's got a bed in it, another rope bed, just like the other ones. And the next one, and it's got clothes hanging there, and it has a potty chair. During the night, if you had to use the uh, pot, it, you, you didn't want to go outside to the outhouse or to the barn where the house was or whatever, this is just a potty chair. They cut a hole in the seat of a chair and put a pot underneath it, and you could use it in the middle of the night and then just empty it in the morning. And then we have a display of hats in this room, too. They're all high beaver hats. And if you look close, you can see that on this one, there's nothing in the middle. But on this one here, there's a little hole in the middle. And it's got a little metal ring around it. And some, a long time ago, maybe some of you men had a baseball cap that had a little ring on the top in the middle that was a hole. Yeah. With it. You know what that was there for? To let the heat out. The one with the hole is a summer hat, and the one without the hole is a winter hat. Those people thought of everything, I mean, really. And you never knew that about your baseball hat, I bet. <laughs> this is the best thing, I think, anyway. This is a picture that was hanging on that wall in the keeping room, and I brought him with me tonight. His name is Capron Peck. He was one of the Peck family children, and his mother's maiden name had been Capron, so they named the baby Capron Peck like that. And on the back of the picture, it says Capron Peck, born in this house on February 4th, 1797. His father, his grandfather, great-grandfather, and his great-great-grandfather lived on this plot. So all those generations lived there from that. And um, I just think that's the neatest thing. Because they all, they all had so much land, it was crazy. And of course, a lot of, like the man that owned my house, he got married three times, and every time he got married, the, the new bride came with more land. So he had more land, and, and even in Daggett's history, it says that um, uh, Banfield Capron, the first Capron to come to America, he's not the one that built my house, it was his son, but anyway, um, he um, gave 175 acres to each one of his children when he died, and he'd had 12 kids, but of course they weren't still all alive, some of them died in infancy. But, um, you know, it was, it was crazy how much land they each all had. So that's about it. Has anybody got any questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you.